This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 402, was produced on November 16th, 2023. I'm Eric Townsend. Economic Cycles Research Institute co-founder Lakshmana Chuthan returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss ECRI's leading indicators, growth and inflation, the hard landing that Locke still predicts, whether inflation is sticky or transient, and much more. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard, week over week as of the close of Wednesday, November 15, 2023. The S&P 500 futures were up 273 basis points, closing at 45.19, an incredible 10% short squeeze rally in just over two weeks. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. The U.S. dollar index down 108 basis points to 104.38, uh, continuing its pullback after its third quarter advance. The January WTI crude oil uh, contract down 75 basis points to 76.79. We'll take a closer look at that chart in the post game, and Eric will have the EIA inventory data. The January uh, RBOB gasoline up 329 basis points to 220. The uh, December gold contract up 31 basis points, closing at 1964. Copper up 220 basis points to 372. And uranium up 302 basis points, closing at 7505, printing a new year high as the trend continues. The U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up three basis points, closing at 453. Yields uh, now 50 basis points off their October highs. Next week, we have the FOMC minutes and the global flash services and manufacturing PMIs. This week's feature interview guest is ECRI co-founder Lakshman Achuthan. Eric, why did we get Lak back as a guest this week? Well, Patrick, Locke is Mr. Cycles. He's the founder of the Economic Cycles Research Institute. The last interview that we had with Locke, and actually the interview before that as well, he said, okay, definitely um, stock market numbers are, uh, you know, lower numbers are still on deck. Recession is still coming. Uh, we're not out of the woods yet. Needless to say, with this incredible strength that we're seeing in the stock market, uh, okay, I wanted to get Locke back on. Does he still think that, uh, you know, with all of this rallying going on? It seemed prudent to get an update on whether or not those recession and hard landing calls uh, that he made previously are still on deck or if he's changed his views. So we wanted to get an update. Eric's interview with Lakshman at Truthin is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is ECRI co-founder Lakshman Chuthan. Lok prepared a slide deck to accompany this week's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you haven't registered yet at MacroVoices.com. Just go to our homepage, MacroVoices.com. Click the red button above Lok's picture that says Looking for the Downloads. Locke, it's great to get you back on the show. I'm really looking forward to this because, boy, last time we spoke, the long-awaited recession was still on deck. We were still expecting it. You thought a hard landing was much more likely, as did I. We saw at that point the stock market was really turning down. Well, guess what? It's turned back up again, which a lot of people didn't expect, back up above the 200-day moving average. It's kind of causing some people to question whether or not that hard landing is still on deck, is it? You know, I think it is. Um, thanks for having me back. Uh, but I, I think it still is on deck. Uh, we spoke in August. Uh, you're absolutely right. We thought a, a hard landing is more likely. We've been continuing to work through all this post-COVID and kind of structural cross-currents that were in the mix that we were talking about back then. And um, we we continue to rely on our on our cyclical framework to kind of see the path forward including uh, is there a reacceleration? Is there a soft landing taking shape? And, and when we look at the cyclical indicators, it doesn't seem to be in sight uh, yet. So the market 
is hopeful, as you said. It's been working uh, up different narratives of kind of threading the needle with inflation coming down, yet growth not coming down that much. And that's a hard, hard needle to thread. Uh, I, I brought a whole bunch of stuff for us to to talk about today to kind of help listeners and, and, and all of us see what we're looking at in terms of these cyclical indicators. And, you know, at the end of the day, I hope I hope there's some more clarity on the direction of where growth and inflation are going, both in the U.S. and abroad. Luck, let's dive into the slide deck starting on page five. Uh, where is this growth that we're talking about? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of um, excitement around the uh, GDP number coming out. Like, uh, I think it was 4.9 was the initial print. And so, therefore, the conclusion immediately was there. there's no recession. It, we, we, we dodged it. And slide five, I think, presents a more comprehensive picture uh, than any one statistic like GDP. It, it's, it's the U.S. coincident index growth rate. You could see the chart shows a very clear slowdown and no acceleration. And and this measure is important because by focusing on multiple measures of economic activity, we avoid the pitfalls of relying solely on a single metric like, say, GDP, although GDP is in that line. And, and there's a well- you know, a well-worn common belief that it's two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth that define a recession. And, you know, that can be the case, but it's not a necessary uh, nor a sufficient uh, way of thinking about uh, what a recession is. It's a, it's really a vicious cycle of falling output, which is GDP and industrial production, or employment, or income and sales. And all of those measures are included in the in the line shown on the chart. I think it's slide five of the deck. Now, GDP is a, a very important metric. As I said, it's in that line, but it doesn't give a full picture of how an economy is doing on a cyclical basis. Uh, listeners may recall that last year, it actually was negative, for, I think, for two quarters in a row in Q1 and Q2, but there wasn't a recession. There was no recession there. Uh, and of course, back in the Great Recession, 07, 09, you didn't see a negative GDP print until July, the end of July of 08, uh, seven months inside the recession. So we think, and you know, I've been doing this for longer than I care to admit, and, uh, and, and looking back at, at previous work of my mentors, that you need to really be looking at a coincident index that includes output, employment, income, and sales to know which way the wind is blowing on the economy. That's our target. And so the key takeaway from, from this slide here is that uh, the revival in growth um, that everyone is kind of banking on, it, it's not here. The slowdown continues. And as I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking and leaning towards uh, it's slowing further perhaps going going negative as opposed to reaccelerating in the near term. Locke, you are Mr. Cycles through and through and obviously very good at looking for and recognizing patterns. Is there a pattern in the or a signal in the very fact that your own indicators have been, you know, in anticipating this recession for longer than it usually takes? It's it's been quite a while now. Is there a precedent where oh, we look back to the, the past five times your indicators were indicating a recession for more than X amount of time? You know, what happened next was fill in the blank. It's a great question. And look, my real time experience uh, begins where I was just, you know, full time looking at cycles begins with the 1990-91 recession. And, and before that, I've studied, but I didn't experience it firsthand. Now, what you're talking about is, okay, the leading indicators turn one way or another, and how long does it take until it shows up in the coincident data? One thing is the coincident data gets revised. So when you're looking at that data today, it's not the way it was in real time when, when those turns happened decades ago. But the answer is there are some times when you get really long leads. I, you know, You can have leads that are over a year easily at turning points, especially on the approach to a downturn. 
The leads on upturns tend to be shorter. It's just the nature of the beast. And so, you know, there were recessions. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in the Great Recession, how you didn't see something like GDP go negative until seven or so, eight months into the recession. You didn't see jobs go negative until uh, about the same lag, like seven or eight months into the 73, 75 recession. I mean, totally different circumstances. But does this framework have long leads in it? Yeah, that can happen. So we can have an average lead of a couple of quarters, but you could have a long lead of more than a year. I think in this instance, the why, why are we seeing such a long period of kind of slowing, but no outright recession? I mean, as I mentioned, you also had two negative quarters of GDP last year what's going on it really is this tug of war it's we're we're really stuck in the backwash of covid there's so many extreme things that occurred one is a huge gutting of labor supply for various reasons which we can get into i'm happy to and the other is a a massive policy response to covid which introduced all kinds of imbalances, uh, in particular in the labor market. And so I think the main reason that the coincident index hasn't gone negative and it kind of slows and then is running at a reasonably weak level is because of the jobs component where uh, there's been a great deal of uh, labor hoarding, of uh, limited supply of workers. If you go to the next slide uh, and look on slide six, You could see the innards of what's going on there. I mean, obviously, jobs growth has continued, and it's part of the narrative around soft landing, right? But the... Tell me a little bit more about page six. Why education and health specifically? You're showing non-farm, and then you're showing uh, non-farm minus education and health. Why those particular sectors? You've got the the view that, hey, the blanket statement, jobs are great, the consumer's hot, uh, we're good to go, we're going to see a reacceleration, and and so on and so forth. And you know that story. But when you look inside of what's going on in the jobs market, you see a classic recessionary performance of uh, education and health jobs versus uh, all the other jobs. And education and health are what we would call non-discretionary kind of things that you need, right? You don't, <laughs> even though some kids would maybe not like to go to school, they have to go to school, right? And and if you want to uh, develop a good career, you probably are, are going to get some training of some sort. And healthcare, it, it's not really discretionary uh, for the most part. If you're if you're sick or hurt, you need healthcare, and so. You see that the jobs growth going into recession, you get this gap that sets up where the non-discretionary jobs growth holds up, but the discretionary jobs growth, everything else, starts to deteriorate uh, noticeably. And and this chart shows how that um, non-farm growth minus education and health is just coming down very, very fast. If you look at past uh, recessions that we show on this chart, back to the uh, early 90s, that gap is a telltale sign of cyclical recessionary weakness uh, in the jobs market. What's different is that we lost uh, several million people out of the jobs market, either from less legal immigration before COVID and then uh, people leaving the workforce or not returning to the workforce post-COVID. And you throw on top of that the big fiscal push on demand, and you get a very, very tight labor market where we have labor hoarding, a very, very reticent set of managers in terms of letting people go. And you are starting to see managers, you know, they've been making some moves over the summer. For example, temporary uh, jobs have been uh, negative growth, right, for, for months now. You've seen hours worked coming down pretty pretty quickly. You see uh, more and more part-timers versus full-timers uh, in terms of jobs growth. 
these are all the levers that managers can pull when they're concerned about weakening demand growth and at the same time remembering how hard it was to hire people uh, not so long ago when, when business was booming. And as a result, we have this situation where so the the hiring is slowing quite quickly. The firing in mass, maybe there were a few companies that took a run at it last year, some bigger ones. And then there really hasn't been a move to shed jobs just yet. Uh, you see the jobless claims still relatively low, right? They're bouncing around off these low levels. Every once in a while, they look like they're going to ramp up and then they and then they ease back. And I think that's this issue of of kind of labor hoarding. I, I remember how hard it was to hire people. And I'm hearing all about this soft landing and how, you know, the Fed is going to stick the landing here. So I'm very hesitant to let people go. I think that's the world we live in right now, this tug of war between cyclical weakness and non-cyclical supply, and maybe even in some cases, demand issues where the federal government really stepped in, like non-residential construction, where if, if, you know, there's some factories being built and, and whatnot that require people. Let's move on to page seven, where you say inflation to stay sticky, you know, the, the, Headline very much matches my own view of uh, I'm expecting a new secular inflation has begun. But as I look at the CPI inflation on your chart, I mean, it doesn't doesn't really it kind of looks like it's headed down, doesn't it? There's a lot of things at play. There's the cyclical, non-cyclical stuff on jobs. And that non-cyclical stuff contributes to the tightness of the labor market, which can be inflationary, of course. And then you've got your uh, structural or secular stuff, which I think you're alluding to, where... You have to be very careful if you're getting higher lows in the inflation cycle. Inflation is going to cycle. That's what it does. But from a structural point of view, you want to be very careful that you're not getting higher lows in those cycles because that can speak to a a bigger problem. Uh, And and I think that's kind of where where you're coming from. On On this slide, on page seven, First, I just want to make a distinction for, for listeners. If you think about it, a lot of analysis on inflation pretty much amounts, and I'm not, it's not a dig at it, it's just the nature of econometric modeling. It, it amounts to extrapolating recent trends in backward-looking price measures. And so the backward-looking price measures would be the, the lower lines there uh, on this chart, uh, the target actual uh, inflation. So you extrapolate it and you're like, oh, it's going down, or at least you hope. In contrast, we're watching our forward-looking future inflation gauges. Um, and they were, they've were they been very prescient. I, I, I think these are a little more esoteric because a lot of people just think about growth and inflation in the same breath, and, and we don't. We really recognize them and treat them as completely separate cycles. And, and the future inflation gauge was very good in catching the strong inflation upturn in 2020, uh, the downturn in 2022. And the point today is that our forward-looking indicators of inflation have been pretty much flat this year. Okay, That should put a damper on hopes of a faster decline uh, in inflation. So if underlying inflation pressures, which is what we're trying to capture with that forward-looking indicator, that means if they're not falling fast, and they're not, then actual inflation is liable to be, you know, quote unquote, stickier for longer. And this is in conflict with kind of the hope that there's going to be all this progress towards the Fed's goals on inflation in fairly short order. And and here we have the, there's a future inflation gauge. I think here I'm showing the alternative future inflation gauge. It's the same concept, but it's a different composition of the actual metric. Uh, And we use it to kind of check and double check the the directional calls. And so these indicators I'm showing you here, they really nailed the earlier turning point calls, and they're saying not so fast right now. And that's at odds, I I think, with some of the expectations on, on what's happening with the inflation cycle. Locke, I hear you on the concept of lower lows uh, it would indicate a, a changing trend maybe to the upside. But at the same time, 
I and a lot of other people have kind of uh, staked our view on the idea that, look, the Fed's never going to be able to get us back down to 2% their target. Now, 2%, if they, let's say they got down to 1.9%. On the one hand, that would be a higher low if we bottomed at 1.9%. It would be a higher low than the previous low, which is like zero. But uh, I would still have to throw in the towel on my view and say, wait a minute, if they got us back down to one9 which is below their target, okay, that's something I didn't think they could do. My my view was proven wrong at that point. So w- how would you see that? Let's say we did get to just below 2%. That's where we bottomed was you know, between 1.7 and, and 2.0. Does that mean that we're still looking at a, a new potentially structural uptrend, or does it mean that that view has been proven wrong? I think the former. I could see a world from a cyclical vantage point, okay, where you go to 1.9, to use the scenario you were just saying, but we're still in a structurally inflationary uh, era, a new era. And, and let me explain how we get there, okay? First off, I'm not sure exactly what the expectations are, but if the expectations are that they're going to get down to two and one, nine and two are basically the same thing. If the expectation is that we're going to get there sometime next year or whenever, the come down in demand that would be associated with that is larger than what's expected. Okay. Typically, inflation cycles will bottom, will trough and reach their lowest readings after the recession is over, not in the recession. So there's some time lags that I think need to be appreciated. You typically have the real come down in prices after the recession in the earlier stages of the re- sometime in the recovery, actually, in the early, you know, it doesn't even have to be early in the recovery. And the second thing is that those are cyclical highs and lows. In the 70s, which is our last inflationary era of note, the lows were under 3% and the highs were over 13% in the cycle of inflation. And it averaged 7% you know, for, the, for that rough decade. So, yeah, sure. If we have a nasty recession, and I don't know that... It, that a hard landing would necessarily be severe or mild at this point. I, that's that's hard to know. But if it was a very um, sharp one, you could have prices go down and inflation go down to 2% and say, oh, we rang the bell, we hit our target. But that might just be a cycle low in an era of higher inflation because productivity is very weak, Right. Uh, you're doing a lot of onshoring, uh, which is inflationary. We're spending a lot of money on defense, uh, which is inflationary. We have a whole bunch of other deficit issues, and we're spending quite a bit, which is inflationary. These are all inflationary things, right? It, it, and the indicators, the future inflation gauge, these these forward-looking indicators, which are measuring underlying inflationary pressures, implicitly are picking all that up. That's the key. They're picking up those underlying drivers of inflation and then they're objectively adding them up uh, and giving us a directional call. And this is what it is. Uh, currently, it's that those underlying measures, while they have not turned up on a cyclical basis, they've stopped falling. And so getting to lower and lower readings in inflation may take a little longer than the market is betting on right now. Lock, on the alternative future inflation gauge on page 7, how long is the typical uh, lead? In other words, the the red line here is the leading indicator, and the coincident indicator is the the black and gray lines. What's the lead time typically? These are, I'd say, on the order of three quarters. The alternative fig is is maybe a little on the longer lead side than that. Uh, On average, over all the inflation cycles, I, I think here we're just looking at a couple of them. But this goes back uh, at least to World War II and in some cases a little earlier. So um, in all those inflation cycles, uh, the average lead is about three quarters. But I wouldn't do a lot of precision on that. I wouldn't line it up and, and bet the store on it. But I think the way to use these indicators is to say, you know, what's the prevailing view? And is the trend, the direction that this is suggesting in agreement or is it diverging? And and right now, if I put words in the market's mouth, right, and I say, ah, you're expecting them to kind of get to their targets sooner rather than later, sometime next year, I'd say not so fast. 
based on the lead times here. If we move on to page eight, instead of the future inflation gauge, you're back to the Fed's official measure, but this time we're looking at the PCE deflator. What's the, the reason for that change and what is this chart telling us? Yeah, so this is, you know, did things get sticky? And, and that little that little bit of a, I don't know what you want to call it, a golf club, a hockey stick at the end there where it where it kind of is going down according to script and then goes sideways is consistent with the, what the forward-looking data said. And I think this is where the, the Fed is kind of dialed in. They're looking for trends in measures like this. And what they need to consider is, wait a minute, did that bottom there or is it going to keep going down? And, you know, I, they want to get that one right. They don't want to make a mistake and prejudge that. So if they assume that that's going to continue going down to very benign readings and it doesn't, now they've got higher lows in the inflation cycle. And that's probably, you know, one of their nightmares, right? I'm sure they have several nightmares, but I bet that's one of them. So they're going to want to avoid that. Powell has said a lot of things. He says, you know, he's getting to be a little bit like Greenspan, where he says a little bit of something for everybody. But I do believe that he does want to try and get it down towards some 2% target. And at the same time, he's aware of the risk of over tightening. But being in such a delicate spot with those forward looking da data going sideways, I, th I think that they know they're they're they've got a problem, and they on balance when you have the unemployment rate very low, when you have job growth still there, they're the odds are they're going to stay restrictive longer than maybe what is hoped in the in the soft landing kind of narrative that is out there. Mind you, you go back to the jobs chart that we had earlier and you have uh, education and health and these kind of things where there's still uh, jobs growth and everything else that's more discretionary is going down. When you look at embedded kind of inflation, one of the things Powell from time to time will talk about is, is wage growth, uh, which is necessary when you have that much inflation as we had. And it's been stuck uh, around five and a quarter percent uh, for the last several months. You know, it did fall over 1% in the previous year. So it went from a six something handle to a five something handle. But it's hard to say that's under control in a, in a, from a Fed policy of position of trying to have low and stable inflation. I think that's a concern that they're going to keep watching. I don't, I don't think they're ready to say mission accomplished just yet. Moving on to page nine, you're comparing the 21 country long leading index, which I believe is an ECRI uh, developed index against world trade volume. Tell us a little bit more about that uh, 21 country long leading index and what this chart is telling us. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about what's going on at home. So directionally, everything is, is to the downside still. The reacceleration is not clear. And the Fed has some challenges. And when we look abroad, it's not like there's, you know, it's not like we're going to get bailed out by some other economy kind of pulling us along. Uh, and that's the point of, of this chart. The 21 country long leading index is, is a leading indicator of growth in those 21 countries. And that's all the major economies, all the big ones, plus all the big emerging markets. Uh, India, China, Russia, South Africa, all these, all these um, uh, emerging markets, and Brazil. And as it happens, that long leading index uh, is also a really good predictor of turning points in world trade. I think the only exception where it wasn't spot on was just pre-COVID when the Trump tariffs went on really fast those kind of came on, they hit trade for a second there pretty quickly. But in terms of kind of the cyclical drivers of trade, this thing nails it. And in September of 22, you had a nice decline 
in trade volumes. I mean, it's clear on the chart. That's what I mean by nice. And it echoes the previous downturn uh, that we saw in this leading index. And that trend of the declining long leading index is predominantly downward. It's right now, it's, it's, it's near the low point uh, that we saw back in July, and that's nearly a two-year low. And mind you, this is, these aren't growth rates. These are levels of activity. Okay, so that's, that's kind of serious. That's the amount of activity. And so here, there's cyclical weakness ahead. There's going to be an ongoing decrease in world trade which is kind of a big deal, I think. It's a big backdrop there. And those kind of sustained downturns in global trade volume, they're typically aligned with broader declines in in overall uh, global activity. So I think that backdrop within which the U.S. is is doing relatively really well is is a pretty tough backdrop. And, And that's an important thing to keep in mind. We're just not getting bailed out by something abroad right now. Let's talk a little bit more about China in specific, because a lot of people had uh, one set of expectations about what was going to happen in terms of China's recovery. Seems like the data is not really showing that. But, you know, I'm also, uh, forgive me for sounding a little conspiratorial here, but I'm also getting a a lot more skeptical of Chinese data lately. And one of the reasons for that is almost everybody in the oil market got caught wrong-footed, really expecting that there was going to be super tight oil markets in Q3 and Q4. It started to happen in Q3, but it didn't really materialize like everybody thought. And what really hit me was... Even after everybody was proven wrong, all the big analysts scratched their head and said, yeah, we still can't figure it out because our data is still telling us that what's happening is not what's happening. And the only explanation for that is a whole bunch of black market oil, you know, oil that has bypassed sanctions, has made its way into supply. So the official supply numbers are smaller than the real world supply numbers. It makes me wonder, okay, what else in terms of Chinese data, if China is not as friendly with the United States as it used to be, might not be accurate? Well, look, let's just stipulate that the data is, uh, to put a nice word on it, funky. Okay. I agree, you know, and we don't hang our hat on any, any one of those pieces of data. The, the cyclical approach that we're describing and showing here, uh, is very forgiving for bad data because to the extent something nefarious is going on, there's probably not an awareness of, um, moving inflection points around. There's probably, you know, you might flatter a number here or there to try to make the level look a little better. But the inflection points uh, we found over many, many decades, over many, many different countries, a lot of emerging markets or whatever markets, and, and those are pretty darn stable. So we think our directional calls on things like China and other emerging markets are really good. And while we saw the mechanistic recovery in China when the post opening, we had a very lonely call where we said, no, it's not off to the races in China uh, because they've got cyclically uh, no recovery in the forward indicators. There's something mechanistic happening, but there's not a lot of there there. And in particular, this was showing up in the industrial leading indicators, our leading indicator for Chinese industrial production growth, which is part of a larger framework of global industrial growth leading indicators, which have been pretty much as bad as they could be earlier on in conjunction with one of the most pervasive global tightenings by central banks that we've ever seen uh, post COVID. So the simple answer is that the cyclical decline in global industrial growth, including inside of China, the, the decline or the weakness in Chinese industrial growth was correctly picked up by leading indicators like the ones I'm describing to you. And I think the narrative got ahead of itself. The reopening, some stimulus, we're off to the races because that were the patterns that you might have seen in, in, in a handful of years earlier. I also want to point out there was another time that came to mind when you said that, uh, when you described uh, the the false start from China this year, 
was in the mid-teens in the United States, we had a, a solid uh, industrial sector downturn, was part of a global industrial downturn. And I remember years later, I saw this big, you know, in-depth research piece in the Times, New York Times, uh, about, oh, this cycle that nobody ever saw. And, and it was plain as day in the cyclical leading indicators, it, but it did not show up. I would, I would agree in, in some of the kind of analyst reports that you might see out of Wall Street. They didn't see it coming. Locke, final question. It seems to me that we're in what I, I feel is a new era of geopolitics. It seems that the Ukraine uh, situation has escalated uh, initially to the point where the U.S. made it clear that one of their goals was to weaken Russia militarily. We do now see some de-escalation of the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. I think that's only because Ukraine has pretty much run out of soldiers to fight with. But we're also seeing, of course, the sudden escalation of the Israel conflict. And a lot of people are fearing a U.S.-China conflict. How do we reconcile or how should we be thinking about the cycles work that you do, which is primarily focused on economic cycles, with this separate geopolitical trend toward what I think is going to be more conflict in the world in coming years? Is it already reflected in your cycles work or do we need to consider that as a separate cycle or how should we be thinking about it? Great question. I, look, the good leading indicators, and I think we have some very good ones, will implicitly pick up the evolution of those issues that you raised. And to the extent they're going to push the cycle in one direction or another, they will manifest. They will show you that. Look, all this conflict, of course, is good for defense companies. <laughs> so they've got a bid. But it also introduces a whole bunch of uncertainty for decision makers, which sometimes may not be a bad thing. I mean, near term, that can contribute to a cyclical slowdown and probably is. But longer term, it may merit some more considered decisions, you know, a little more kicking of the tires when 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 you're doing things. There's going to be obviously some onshoring and things like that going on. If you're going to invest and build, you're going to think it through a bit more. Uh, I think also with the inflation, the cost of capital going up, you're also going to challenge your business models a bit more than you would before. Earlier on, hell, you know, I'm happy to carry a ton of inventory because it doesn't cost me anything to finance it. Now, uh, do I want to tie up my money doing that? These are good questions probably. So I think that things are changing, uh, obviously. I think there may be a silver lining here in some of the more considered decision-making longer term. However, short term, it, business as usual is, is certainly challenged. Uh, those, those business plans that worked in the lower inflation, very uh, all the skies are, are blue uh, environment of several years ago, uh, won't fly today. Recessions, if that's what we end up with here, look, recessions are not the end of the world. They're not Armageddon. Uh, they're part and parcel of a free market oriented economy. There can be collateral damage and, and it hurts to be the, the vulnerable people that get hurt by it, but they're cathartic for the overall system in that they kind of weed out the less productive, uh, more vulnerable, maybe unwarranted activities and focus uh, the economy on more productive and profitable ventures. That's what recessions do. It's, it's, it's an important part of a free market. Locke, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, please tell us a little bit more about what you do at ECRI, which is primarily an institutional research firm. We have quite a few institutional listeners. What uh, services are on offer and how can they find out more about what you do? You know, I'm not a natural at this, but I say, you know, we want to partner and, and work with institutions that are, that are trying to figure out how to systematically lean on the right side of these cyclical moves. What I've seen, look, I've been, as I mentioned, I've been doing this since 1990 with companies and investors, is that these, if you get on the right side of these cyclical moves, might I even say tactical moves, right, that you start to outperform your peers and you have strategic opportunities. 
And that's what we're really providing. And we're, I'm sorry, we're at businesscycle.com and uh, you can find us there or on LinkedIn. And those contact details are also on the last page of the slide deck. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Galarnik, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Energy Transition Crisis, my new video documentary series about energy transition, has finally been released, and anyone can watch it for free at energytransitioncrisis.org. The series explains exactly what it's really going to take to break humanity's addiction to fossil fuels and why it will take longer and cost more than almost anyone realizes. And I'd like to think the three episodes on nuclear energy are among the most detailed on YouTube. This is a passion project for me, and there's no profit motive, no revenue, and therefore no budget other than donations. I'd really appreciate your help promoting the series. Things you can do to help include subscribing to the Energy Crisis Doc YouTube channel, liking every episode, posting comments on YouTube, and posting links to your favorite episodes on social media. If you don't have time to do those things, there's also a donations page at energytransitioncrisis.org. The money does not go to me. 100% of it will be spent on YouTube and other social media advertising to promote the series. Thanks in advance for your help. Now let's get back to the show and Patrick's post-game chart deck. Now back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Lack back on the show. Now, joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now, let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Lack's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's uh, cover crude oil starting with the EIA inventory data. EIA printed a build of 3.6 million barrels nationally and then 1.9 million barrels desperately needed in Cushing, Oklahoma. Finished products were the drawdowns on the board with gasoline drawing down 1.5 million barrels and distillates drawing down 1.4 million barrels. U.S. production was unchanged at 13.2 million barrels. The supply deficit predicted by almost everyone just plain isn't happening. That means black market oil is bypassing sanctions and entering the market, and that in turn means that analysts who are working from official data will continue to get their predictions wrong. So I think we're moving into a guessing game market where analyst predictions based on official data are not going to be reliable. Crashing time spreads on WTI bode of more weakness to come. The third month shows only three cents of backwardation and the out months are falling fast as both national and Cushing inventories are finally starting to build again. If the whole curve moves into structural contango, that suggests a much bigger bearish move could be afoot. And by the way, folks, it always starts at the beginning of the curve, which is what's falling into contango right now. So we need to watch those out months, six months to 12 months out on the curve and see if those time spreads continue to move lower. And if they start to fall into contango, we've really got a serious bearish indication. But for now, it's only an early sign. As of this recording, just after the European Open early on Thursday morning, we're just barely holding on to the 200-day moving average on the contract chart on WTI. We're well below the 200-day moving average on the continuation chart, and we're also below all three of the short-term moving averages, the 5, 8, and 13-day moving average. This is after we had a failed rally a couple of days ago, right at the 13-day moving average, which is a textbook failure point. For now, at least early, early on Thursday morning, we're still above that 200-day contract moving average. If we can stay there, maybe there's a chance of recovery. But if we get a daily close below the 200, which is 76 spot 18 on the January WTI contract, if uh, that happens, we're probably headed back lower. The next major supports below the market are 73 spot 28 and 70 spot 03, which is the 200-week moving average. Israel's military had a flag-raising ceremony in Gaza last Friday, and that caused Iran to reiterate that any occupation or annexation of Gaza is certain to result in a broader regional war. But so far, markets are ignoring those statements. 
While it was a very steep pullback in crude oil over the last couple of weeks, uh, I was looking to see how the uh, price action would behave during a bounce. And so far, the price action is disappointingly weak. And uh, the longer we spend below $80 on WTI, uh, the more likely it is that the market is still uh, got uh, further weakness as the prevailing trend will remain dominant. Uh, for my, in my mind, uh, the only way uh, that we've established the uh, trading low is if we get back above 80 on the short term and uh, and the bulls really start putting together some back-to-back days on the upside uh is the uh, it in the cards for us to go and retest uh, uh the third quarter lows uh, you know, it's not a scenario that I uh, put a lot of weight to originally, but uh, right now with the way the price action is behaving, it's certainly something that can't be taken off the table. Moving on to equities, though, uh, Eric, what's your thoughts here on the markets? Well, just looking at the chart alone, it's extremely bullish, and the next major upside target for the S&P is 46.12. But let's look a little more closely at what's driving all this exuberance. The big event this week was Tuesday morning CPI print. The market is acting as though an earth-shattering event just occurred, absolutely positively guaranteeing that rate hikes are done and forgotten, and that rate cuts are surely just around the corner. Wait a minute. All of this hopium was fueled by a lousy 0.1% miss on consensus expectations for the CPI print? I think the market is really reading a lot more into this than actually happened. One print doesn't make a new trend, and nothing ever goes in a straight line. It's entirely plausible that the peak rates moment that everyone is obsessed with is now behind us. Just like it was plausible that the so-called dovish pivot from the Fed might have happened each one of the 17 or so times that market pundits declared it to be imminent in the last three years. But it's also equally plausible that this is a normal pullback and that inflation will return. More to the point, it's also plausible that the reason inflation is falling is that the hard landing and recession that Locke predicted in the feature interview is about to hit the economy. My point is, it's too early to know for sure where we stand, and I think the hopium was exaggerated on Tuesday. As of this recording, stocks are still holding their gains, but both gold and oil have given back much of their Tuesday gains, so to my thinking, the jury is still out. Declining inflation isn't bullish if it's actually signaling the beginning of a deep recession, and nobody seems to be considering that angle. All right, I want to get Nick in this conversation. Nick, what uh, levels are you watching on the S&P? Yeah, Patrick. So spot price right now on SPX is 4500 We have a call wall right at this current level at 4500 and a put wall below at 4200 The implied move for the December 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 120 points. Thus, the upper potential move is 46.20, and the lower potential move is 43.80. I'm inclined to think that we see some consolidation slash downward action, perhaps. Now, we have four gap fills below right now on SPX because we declined in about two weeks' time about 6.55%, hit a low at 41.05, and since then, in just 12 trading days, we're up 10.2%, which is a substantial rally. I think it was a lot more than people thought would happen. And right now we have four gaps below. The gap at 44.11 is what I'm targeting for a possible consolidation level. So about 2% decline from the current levels. Uh, and I do think we, do, we get a late year rally perhaps to that 46.50 mark, given that we've already breached the 4,500 area. Um, I don't really see a catalyst for downward action. Uh, although there is FOMC just before the December OPEX on December 12th and 13th. If Powell does sound off on keeping rates higher for longer, that may trigger a downward move in broad markets. To me, it's incredible that there was such a huge short squeeze on the S&P 500. It just shows how offside participants were, where uh, sentiment could cause such a huge reversal in trend. But now that the NASDAQ is pretty much testing its major highs and the S&P 500 is stone throw away from there, uh, there's no asymmetry in pressing the long trade. Uh, at this moment, we're going to see some sort of a consolidation. And the way the bulls can cons- uh, buy the dip and defend pullbacks is going to be the real key information. 
discussion uh, as to whether this trend can continue into the holiday season. So let's see uh, whether or not uh, uh, all pullbacks can be held above moving averages and FIB zones, and uh, we'll see how it progresses from there. Uh, what are you watching on, on the NASDAQ in terms of the levels, Nick? Yeah, Patrick. So on Qs right now, the spot price is 385 we have a call wall just above at 390 and a put wall below at 345. The implied move is plus minus 14 points for the December 15th monthly OPEX. Therefore, the upper expected move is to 399, just below those all-time highs at 408, which is which also act as key resistance. And we have a lower expected move of 371, which is just above the lower support at 370. But keep in mind that next Tuesday, we have NVIDIA's earning report, which should sway the tech sector a fair bit. But right now, given that we're so close to all-time highs, again, I'm very, very skeptical that we're going to see a push up there for the simple reason that a lot of these names are very, very overvalued. And in the last couple of weeks, with such an extravagant run in the markets, I think it's possible we pause or decline. And I'm much, much more inclined to favor the small caps in the form of IWM, which have done pretty well the last couple of weeks. Now, moving on to the US dollar index, what are your thoughts here, Eric? Well, we've finally broken out of the 105 to 107 consolidation range decisively, setting up a new downsloping price channel on the Dixie chart. Now the question becomes, what's the next downside target? And I don't have an opinion on that, at least not yet. Yeah, incredible drop on the dollar on the CPI, but we haven't yet uh, even 50% retraced the uh, summer rally uh, and the rally we had throughout the third quarter. Uh, the dollar at this stage continues to be vulnerable to consolidate for the rest of the year, but generally I still believe the dollar will prevail with a bull run. So I think that the consolidations toward 103 uh, can still happen and, and even take more than a month to consolidate in those zones. But uh, overall, uh, we're uh, all ready uh, uh, three points off of the highs. And uh, certainly, I think much of the damage is already uh, rear view mirror. Uh, I think a, a further one point downside risk uh, over the course of a month is uh, a more realistic expectation in terms of what to expect here next. Now, moving on to gold futures, what are you guys thinking here? At first glance, the correction appears to be over and gold looks to be headed back to new all-time highs. But uh, hold on, let's not get too excited, at least not quite yet. Almost all of the reason the chart looks so much better this week than it did last week is the big move up in reaction to Tuesday's CPI print. And as I said in my equities commentary, I think the exuberance was a little bit overblown. The move higher took us to a textbook test of the 13-day moving average, the highest of the three short-term moving averages. And just like oil, that's where the rally failed. Unlike oil, gold is still above its 5- and 200-day moving averages at 1957 and 1949, respectively. And so long as it stays above those levels, we can say that a new uptrend may be forming. But a break and daily close below 1957, and particularly below 1949, could signal that a test of the 50% FIB level at 1922 is still on deck before this correction in gold is over. On the other hand, what would persuade me that the move toward testing all-time highs really is on would be a close over 1982, and for the market to stay above that level for a few days. That would put all the moving average resistances below the price action and clear the way for a move first to recent highs at 2020 and then on to retest the all-time high at 2085. Well, typical reaction in gold, in my mind, uh, as uh, gold is strengthening in a period where the dollar is weakening and we're risk on in general, uh, and uh, as we approach uh, potentially uh, the Fed pivoting and eventually an easing cycle, which typically is a tailwind for gold, uh, we see gold and silver both reacting off their lows. I really want to see gold clear 2000 on the upside where we were just trading a few weeks ago in order to really confirm that some new bull trend is is resumed. And so uh, it's certainly going to be important to see whether that follow through emerges. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's research roundup. In this week's research roundup, you can find the transcript for today's interview, as well as the slide deck from LAC and the chart book we just discussed here in the post game, including a, a link to a number of articles that we found interesting. So you're going to find this 
and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That is Eric spelled with a K. And follow Patrick at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Serezna, and myself, thanks for listening and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>